Right. Well, this is a lousy start to a video. I gotta start by turning on the projector. So if you just joined us, we're turning on the projector. That's okay, though. You can edit the video. We'll set it that out. Hmm? <laughs> All right, we were talking about the GNOME rotary engine, which is also, we coined the phrase, the radio, radio rotary, rotary radial. All right. So let's see. And the funny thing about that one is the crankshaft is mounted to the airframe. So crankshaft, the crankshaft is mounted mounted to the airframe, which is another way of saying it's mounted to the aircraft. And then the crankcase and cylinders. So the crankcase, crankcase, and cylinders rotate. Uh, we can look at some pros and cons. Pros. What are some pros to that? Well, no need for a counterweighted, <coughs> a counterweighted crankshaft. I'm gonna show you a little bit what a real crankshaft, a crankshaft looks like for an actual radial engine. They're heavily counterweighted on one end. Uh, hey, it had great cooling. Why? <coughs> Two reasons. One, the, so, uh, the, a radial engine uh, they're very ra all the cylinders are getting fresh air. There's nothing behind another one. So they're all out front. They all have a large frontal area, and so they're getting the air coming at them in flight, and they're rotating. So they really was getting some great cooling on that one. Um, no need for an exhaust. <coughs> oh, yeah. This would be a pro. We can do that. No need for exhaust. So there's a bunch of them. Right, just a couple of them in here. So cons. What are some cons? Dangerous. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay, so well, we talked about the oiling problems. Uh, it's a centrifugal force actually threw the oil out after its first trip through the engine. So you got one trip through the engine and then it went out. And so you had to have an oil tank feeding oil at all times. So it was a, I guess you could say, it was a race to see which happened first. You run out of fuel first or run out of oil first. So you had those oiling problems. And then also it used, um, well, it was that, the one trip through, and then it used castor oil, castor oil, which uh, made the pilots nauseated and poopy. and poopy. And then gyroscopic procession. <coughs> or the gyroscopic effect on turning, on turning. You're going to get to hear all about gyroscopic effect in Aero 300. Is that not correct? Yeah, correct. You want to tell me about it? No, you better be able to explain it. Well, let's go. Let's hear it. I'm good. <laughs> all right. So what's next on my list here? No, Oiling and gyroscopic effect. <laughs> All right, we looked at that one. All right, who knows what this engine is? It's a Curtis OX-5. He says that right there. So who made the Curtis OX-5? That's right. First American-designed aircraft engine to enter mass production, although it was considered obsolete when it did so in 1917. So that was the OX-5. What kind of uh, arrangement would this be on here? VV what? V8. V8. All right, very good. <coughs> because it's in a V shape. And how do you know it's eight? Because there are one, two, three, four exhaust pipes. And there we go. So. And water cooled too, right? It was. Liquid cooled. So it's kind of unusual, not totally unheard of, but unusual to see a liquid cooled aircraft engine for a couple of reasons. One, there we go. One is that there's plenty of air where aircraft go. So air makes a great cooling medium. Uh, two, you have a complexity with water cooled. Uh, which doesn't is not a problem in air in automobiles because if something fails, you just pull over and call the tow truck. But when you add water cooling, number one, you add weight because you have to have the water jackets. Uh, two, you add complexity because well, we'll go back to weight. You have weight because the water jackets. You have to have a radiator. You have to have radiator lines and water reservoir. 
So you're gonna add all of that weight, and it's all right. <laughs> we want a cookie? No, I don't want a cookie. Um, then you're gonna have some drag because the radiator has to be have air cooled through it, and then if you obviously if you have some sort of leakage from the water pump or start losing coolant, you are going to overheat and seize up. So that was a problem. <coughs> So is that an extra deep sump, or is it just the way the picture was taken? That's a pretty deep sump. I don't know, it might be thin. I'm not really familiar with this one. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> it's 1917, I was pretty young back then. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And the Curtis OX5. I don't even know what the OX was. That was water cooled, so water cooled. Water-cooled V8, and that was, what, 1918. <coughs> All right, then we moved into, according to this book, the way they did it, um, the World War I engines, although I don't necessarily agree, but uh, we start with those. They came out with the inline engine, inline. <coughs> so the inline engines had a single row of cylinders. We talked about this one. I think this might be a Ranger engine. Uh, and there's a lot of issues going on with the Ranger engine. Why do you think that they put the cylinders on the bottom? So the pilot can see? You've already had most of this class. I know, just I know. <laughs> That's why I'd wave my hand. Yes. Me? Yeah. Well, you had your hand up. Well, yeah, to keep the prop away from the landing gear. There you go. So the prop shaft is way up here. So they wanted to move the prop shaft up as high as they could so that there was clearance between the bottom of the prop and the ground. If you turn it around the other way, the prop shaft is going to be down here. And so if you look at all aircraft designs, you want the prop shaft really kind of close to where the, just under the pilot's line of sight disappears. You don't have this hood and then way down there somewhere is the prop shaft. So you want to get the prop shaft up. You can't have cylinders sticking up here. That wouldn't work too well because you couldn't see around them. So put the cylinders upside down. Well, that creates a whole lot of problems. And the Ranger uh, is notorious for these back cylinders baking. So they get very hot because they're all in a line. So they don't get very good cooling back in here. So those get hot really fast. Uh, the other thing is what happens to the oil that runs through and lubricates the top end, which is now the bottom end. It's the rock, I should say, the rocker arms and stuff like that. It doesn't go back up. No, so you gotta have a pump. It's gonna collect it here, you gotta pump. You gotta pump it back up into here. You know, um, I don't think this is a Ranger. I mean, Rangers look just like it, I can't tell. There's also a British version that's, I forget what it is. Uh, I think I built two Rangers, one or two. Some of the most beautiful interior I've ever seen of an engine. Every part was just gorgeous. It's an old Bendix lunchbox right there. All right, so we got the Ranger. Inline engine, let me see. Can you turn it upside down Yeah, yeah, you can. Uh, let's see, inline engine, when we had a single row, single row of cylinders. Um, usually has the, usually has crank, you guys, usually has um, cylinders on the bottom. <coughs> I think there were a few that did not. And the example I gave you is the Ranger. <coughs> the Space Ranger. All right, so what are, let me see, that. What are the, what are the pros? Anybody got a guess? <coughs> well, had less surface area. Dinner. Less surface, dinner? Dinner. <laughs> Thinner. <laughs> thinner. No, I just ate. Yes, less surface area, so it's thinner. So it didn't have all the cylinders sticking all out there in the airstream. So brought it in, it became thinner, so it's more streamlined. Uh, let's see. Um, they still have a split case? Yeah. Oh, that's how you get the, the let's go back. Right there. There's the split line. So take off the nose section, and it splits right there. All right, so less surface area, um, inverted. I -B -E -R. 
inverted had better visibility. Also, if you wanted to fly inverted, they were perfect because the cylinders are not going in the right way up. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, cons. Well, what's bad about them? Let's see. Difficult to cool. Difficult to cool back cylinders. Um, had a poor weight to power ratio. Now always write that like this. Poor. I hate it when books said, well, it had a really high power to weight. Cons, high power to weight ratio. Well, wait, I, so, and I have to think too hard. So I was like, say, it had a bad power to weight ratio. And you're like, oh, I got it. It weighed a lot for the amount of power it put out. So poor uh, weight to power ratio. So not a lot of horsepower for as much as they weighed. All right, then we get into. Would the crankshaft <coughs> rust quickly? No, not because it's up high. Because it's above the, the cylinders, so the oil would fall. No, it really isn't going to be any different than a horizontally opposed where the cylinders are out here mm -hmm. and the crankshaft is just in the middle. All right, um, WW2 <coughs> and beyond. And again, the book I read loved them in this way, but you know, the more I think about it, I think, well, Ranger engine was way, you know, World War II and beyond. They put it in Fairchild's. Uh, I don't see any up on the wall that I can see, but Fairchild's are really common aircraft that used them. Uh, beyond. Well, we started in World War II and beyond. We had the radial engine, the true radial. Radial engine. Here we have all kinds of radial engines. We have, let's see, well, we can start down here. I know probably a Kinner, one, two, three, four, five. Radial engine on a, probably a Ryan, PT something or another. I have a Stearman with a Continental 220 on it that has seven cylinders. Then we can move over here. Here's a Lycoming uh, R680 with a 300 horse. So I forget the horse here. This would be 220 horse. Got up to 300 horse at this model. And then the more common Pratt & Whitney 985 that hit 450 horsepower. So uh, naturally aspirated, naturally aspirated. Um, this one has a diffuser in it. It didn't really boost the pressure, but it had a diffuser in it. It looked like an internal blower. <coughs> this one is internally supercharged. Oh. The bottom left one, did they have problems with the exhaust on it? Like it all pulling into one and then going out? That's called a collector ring. So that's really kind of common. And in fact, they made this engine in a couple horsepower versions. The lower horsepower versions, they put the exhaust on the back. I don't know why they did that. That's how I can tell it's 300 horse, because I have the front-based front, front -based one. So, um, no, not really. Uh, they, they tend to crack. But this one has the same thing. It's just in the back. Okay. And this has the same thing, too. It's just in the back. So you can see the one stack coming out right there. Uh -huh. hmm. All right. Always going to be how many cylinders? Five, seven, and nine. All right, so that's, they're all single row. So the nice thing about single row, they had a uh, pretty good power to weight ratio, got a lot of power for how much they weighed. Um, had great cooling because all the cylinders are out the front there, and they got rid of the gyroscopic effect because these don't spin around. They stay put. Um, what else? Oh, bad part. They're very large. A large surface area. You know, that top one, top one here is you know, that big around. So it's a pretty big engine. <clears throat> All right, radial engine. Let's see. Should try to abbreviate some of this. So radial engine. Let's see. Unlike the other one, the crank shaft, the crank case, crank case, is mounted to the aircraft. And the crankshaft spins this time, and the crank spins. Which makes more sense. Uh, one, two, single row, single row radial has odd number of cylinders. <coughs> And a double row 
has an even number. Has an even number. Why is that? <laughs> Two odds make it even. And if it is a double row, then the two rows or two rows are staggered <clears throat> to allow cooling, to allow, to allow better cooling. Ah, uh, see, what are some of my pros? Pros. Well, they're very sturdy. They're a very sturdy design. Um, Good power to weight. Good power to weight. In fact, this book said it's got the best power to weight, power to weight ratio, and good cooling. What's my con? It's big, so that means a large frontal area. Large frontal area. Area, which means drag. Very good. Who said drag? You said that? <laughs> uh, let's see, we had some common, common radio engines. <coughs> what did I have on there? Okay here. As Phil would say, this is almost just G Wiz information. Steerman. Oh, uh, the Steerman. The Steerman was. That's kind of my. I built a couple of Steerman, so I really enjoy them. That's all three of these are like Steermans, so probably. Sometimes you can't tell Steerman between like some other common biplanes, but they all look like Boeing Steermans. Not this one. Uh, Boeing Steerman. It came out of the factory with. Let's see. Uh, the W670. That was the Continental. So Continental. W670, that was a seven cylinder that put out 220 horsepower. And we have a, a cutaway of one of these actually out in the, the shop floor. Then Lycoming, they also made one for this. They call it the R680. What does the 670 probably mean? 670 cubic inch, what's the R680? I don't know where they got the W, but like I said before, Continental was doing like the A65, the C90, and I don't know, maybe that's where they got the W all down the line. They were going to fill it all in with all different kind of engines. Um, the R680 stood for radial 680. That's a nine-cylinder, and that went up to uh, it was 225, all the way up to 300 horsepower. Um, then they converted these Stearmans to crop dusters, <coughs> and they don't anymore. <laughs> There's a lot of money to be had in building up Stearmans, and they are becomes, I knew a guy who, I actually knew the guy, he said he bought enough Stearman surplus, flew them home, took the gas out of them and sold the gas and made up enough money for the Stearmans that he just bought. They were just giving them away. It was almost like, take them out of here, please. And nowadays, a Stearman's a hundred, it's a hundred thousand dollar aeroft. Yeah, they just give them away. So anyway, uh, then they converted them to crop dusters, and now they're converting back. And of course, they still do make some crop dusters with um, crop dusters. I say, and others. I mean, 980. These these engines are really common. I look around; uh, it's probably on the Electra there, or that might be a um, Twin Beach, uh, the Staggerwing Beach. Um, I don't even know what the next one is over. Uh, but there's so many planes in here, the radial engines, that these are actually rather common. So there was the um, Pratt & Whitney. Pratt & Whitney. The R985. What's the 985 stand for? 985 cubic inch. Had nine cylinders and was 450 horsepower. Um, let me see. The bigger one is the Pratt & Whitney. Pratt & Whitney. <coughs> Its big brother was the R1340, still a single row nine cylinder, and that was 600 horsepower. Uh, then we got into some nice big stuff, because those are just little engines. There was the B29, this aircraft, the B29. It used an 
R3350. So what's the 3350 stand for? 3,350 3, horsepower. Uh, twin row. Twin row. 18 cylinder. At 2,200 horsepower. Or actually, it went 2,200 all the way up to 3,700, depending on the model horsepower. Um, some other planes like the Boeing. that up B -O -E -I -N. Boeing uh, C-97 the Douglas C-124 a bunch of other Fairchild transports the Boeing B-50 consolidated B-36 bombers they use the Pratt & Whitney I was looking <coughs> Pratt & Whitney R-4360s <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't think any of these little ones now out of the museum, yeah. Well, there's, by the time you get to these big old engines, oh, actually, some I think there's a Bearcat up there. That might have used one. Um, so some of the really big single-engine fighters. I'm not really that much of a historian when it comes to this stuff. That's Phil. Yeah. What about the Sherman tank? The Sherman tank used the Continental. So horizontal? Yeah. It was only differences is a different crankshaft. So I guess I do know some weird stuff. All right, the largest radial Pratt & Whitney ever built was the R4360, which is what I just talked about. 28 cylinders producing 3,500 horsepower. So 28 cylinders, how many rows? One, two, three, four. There you go, there's your B50. Here's the R4. When Prince was in here, Prince was great. I just turned the class over to him at this time. He would give a great lecture on this stuff. All right, so let's go trivia here. Alan's excluded. Did it have more of them? Yes. The largest, the largest piston engine that actually ran, produced, was real. Anybody care to guess how many? Um, um, guess the displacement. No, knowing that 4360 was pretty much where we stopped. Who holds the record for the largest? Anybody? Well, Lycoming. Lycoming holds the record. They did not mass produce it. 4,000, th 4, we're looking for cubic, cubic inches here. It's gotta be bigger than 4,360. Was the XR, X meaning experimental radial, 7,755. So 7,750 cubic inch displacement. It had 36 cylinders. How many spark plugs would that be? 36 times two. Seven, thank you, seven, 70, <laughs> 72, 72 spark plugs, that's four rows of nine. Uh, it produced 7,000 horsepower, uh, 10 feet long, five feet in diameter, which actually seems small to me, yeah. it weighed 6,050 pounds. It, oh, I love this, I'm gonna write this down. It burned 580 gallons per hour <laughs> at max horsepower. At max horsepower, five, so. <laughs> That's me right here. I think they made four. I'm not sure of that maybe. <laughs> so I found this animation. Radial engines. We're going to talk about some stuff here and there. They have a. F they have a. Uh, okay. Stop. Um, I can't stop it. <laughs> anyway, they have, what is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is a nine cylinder. I wish it would stop. Uh, <laughs> making me sick and dizzy. Can you freeze the projector? Oh, yeah, that would work. But those, those of you at home won't be able to do this. All right, sorry. All right, so you can, okay, that's better. <laughs> <They> can freeze. <laughs> freeze. All right. So, nine cylinders. You'll notice that there are eight holes here, and it's missing a hole. Mm -hmm. All right, where it's missing a hole, that is actually uh, the master rod. And this is kind of funny. I guess if this is one, then this is two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, we can't do 
<laughs> so this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is in the number eight spot. Or maybe this is, if I count this one, that's eight. So the master rod's in the number eight spot. And the data plate would actually have to tell you that the master rod is in the number eight spot. Because as a mechanic, you always have to know where the master rod is located. Because the master rod cylinder, and I'll tell you about this later, is always has to be, that cylinder has to be the last off and the first on. And if you screw that up, you will screw up really bad. Because most of these engines have rings down here at the bottom. And what happens is, without this here, this articulates in a way it was never meant to move. And so this cylinder will actually go up further than it ever intended to. And that last little ring, you can hear it, it goes pink. And what you did is you have the base of the cylinder and the, the piston comes out just a little bit too far and that ring goes pink and it expands right outside. And then you've got a really nice big lever called the propeller and you're like, hmm, oh there, it went, don't worry. It just shattered the ring all inside of the cylinder. But you just do that eight more times and then it runs just fine. So, so that's why that, the master rod cylinder pilots it to keep it from going too far. So these are called articulating rods. This is the master rod. And even when it operates, it doesn't operate in a perfect circle. It operates in a concentric circle. I'll unfreeze it. I don't know. If I saw this on YouTube. Oh, it was really Hi, cool. my name is Ian, and this is my latest project. It's a model. It's got made out of wood. It's an radial engine. And I thought before I totally finished it and moved it out of the garage, I would take it apart and show the inner workings on how a radial engine works. Now, there's some really cool animations and, and cutaway views of actual airplane engines slowly rotating with the motor, but nothing explains how they work, or, or why they work, or what's going on on the inside. So I thought I would make a video, slowly take my apart step by step, showing each major component and how they all work together. Okay, so what I've done is I've removed the front cover and some of the internal workings, so we have a better view of what's going on on the inside. Before we look inside, we'll address the outside. So just like every other engine out there, a radial engine has numbered cylinders. Looking at the radial engine from the front, the propeller side of things, starting at the top is the number. So I may not have the time to give you 10 minutes of this, but you can watch that when you, I think I put it in canvas. But you'll notice that there is actually a pretty large counterweight that has to go around because, because the crankshaft is up here, it's only got one throw, so it's got to have a counterweight down below. We're going to talk more about radial engines as we go, but I just kind of wanted to let you see, you know, radial engine. And I said, I don't think you want to watch this, you can. You said it's on canvas? I think I'll put it on canvas, or you can just watch it on YouTube. So. Or we can watch it on break. All right, um, let's see, so we have that one. And then we get to... The horizontally opposed. All right, this is the most common in aircraft today. Most common in aircraft today. Almost everything out there to you is now horizontally opposed. Uh, especially if it's more modern uh, pros. Well, they say it's dependable. Whoever they is. They say it has good power to weight ratio. What does that mean? More power than weight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not more power than weight. Good power to weight ratio. That means for its given weight, Compared to other things, it actually produces some decent horsepower. Because what good would it do if it produced 200 horsepower but weighed a ton? Like, okay, it would never get the air, it would never get off the ground. So it has good power to ratio, which means it doesn't weigh a whole lot for what it produces. Uh, I, I'm just going to laugh at this one. 
economical. If you think that any aircraft engines are economical, you have a rich family. <laughs> so we'll just put this in relative terms. Relative terms. Meaning that it's cheaper and more it's economical. It's more economical than owning a turbine engine. <laughs> we'll just we'll leave it at that. Like, oh yeah, that, that makes sense. It does have a good low profile. They're very short. You've seen that. They're what? Less than a foot tall without the sump. So they're very low profile. So you can see over them well. They're up from the ground well. Uh, reasonably free from vibration. Reasonably free from vibration. Um, now what are my big cons? Really not a lot. The rear cylinders do run a little bit hotter. Rear cylinders run hotter. That's really the big one. There's not much more about them. It's bad. That's why they're so common. And we already talked about that we could then, this is just redundant, so I'm not going to write this. <coughs> Cylinder arrangement is inline, opposed, V-type, double V, radial, X-type, opposed, cool, uh, by cooling, air, liquid. All right, but then we didn't talk about this, so I want to make this, so nine. We'll, put, we'll call this one designators. All right, so if you're going to be in aviation, especially around general aviation, you got to speak the lingo. And the lingo, when you start talking about especially horizontally opposed engines, is they have designators for them. And like you are working on an O290-D. Well, what does the O mean? O means something very specific. It means it's opposed engine. Well, they have all kinds of designators. So I guess we could do that with O for opposed. It means it's a horizontally opposed. Um, we've got an L, so I could have like an LO290. Never made such a thing. But if I wanted to, an L, well, what is left? Left hand rotation. When viewed from the pilot's perspective. Why, why would I want one that turns backwards? Because you're from another country. <laughs> <laughs> the twin? The twin. Not a lot of twins do this. Most of them both turn to the right. That's this way for you. Uh, but some of them, like the uh, Piper Seneca, they used an LIO 360. So one went right, one went left. Uh, let's see, we have, this can get a little fusing, but the T, turbocharged. Turbocharged. Uh, Lycoming uses the T. They just use like the TIO. Uh, TS, turbo supercharged. Uh, v. <laughs> VTEC. <laughs> it's not a Honda. Is that Honda? Vertical. Instead of the engine being placed this way with the crankshaft coming out this way, they're going to set it this way and go straight up. Helicopter. Helicopter. For helicopter. And tanks. And yeah. tanks. All right. But what if it's an H? Horizontal. Well, don't you have a horizontal? It's for helicopter use. So, hor it's okay, was it horse horsezontal. Horsezontal. Like a horse's back. Horse's back. Horsezontal. What kind like of engine is in the death trap on the trailer over there? Like a Rotax of some sort. Uh, horizontal, but for helicopter use. Uh, how about A? <coughs> Aerobatic. Well, uh, what is AE? <laughs> Aerobatic engine. Okay, so Lycoming made an A version. It was extremely expensive because it had a different crankcase and they put a sump on both ends. And then when they did a product design change, they just called it an AE, which is actually, it looks like a normal engine, 
but it has an inverted oil sump system in it. So it became a lot cheaper to make that one. So you'll see the AE as is more, I can put this one. Inverted, aerobatic use. So not only will it fly in, inverted. Uh, yeah, you can do flips, rolls, you know, all that, all that junk. Um, let me see. So this one was uh, sump on top and bottom. When we talk about oil systems, we'll talk more about the aerobatic oil oil system. It was very, very expensive. I've never even seen one. They're pretty rare. But the AE aerobatic engine, so they would do the inverted oil system. It has a heavier crankshaft flange. It has a thicker crank on it. Uh, they're just set up for doing all kinds of stuff. Um, what do you have? Oh, then I. What is I? Fuel injected. Oops, not with a G. Dang it. Fuel injected, and uh, let me see. Oh, I got a couple more, so we'll go up. You guys cool here? Can I go? Can I move? Yes. All right. Trying to go slow here. What if it's got a G? Geared. It means it's got a geared front end to it, so it's got a reduction. So the engine's going to spin faster then the prop should spin, and so it's going to reduce it down so the prop spins at a proper speed, which we'll talk about why that has to happen. So, let's see. And, of course, we know what O. I already did O, so we'll not do that one again. O. Um, R was what? Radial. Radial. And then, of course, I also said this is the newer convention because the older ones, we had the exceptions. We'll do exceptions. Exceptions are the older engines. We had like the A65, which was just an A model with 65 horsepower. Or we had the C90, which was a C model with 90 horsepower. Or like the one that they built for the Bonanzas, the E185 and the E225s. And that just tells you the horsepower. So 65 horse, 90 horse, 185 horse. But now they uh, talk about it more in cubic inches. So that's the first designation. So we could put some all together. What if I have a... TSIO 360. What do I got? Turbo supercharged, injected, opposed. Um, one of the more common complicated is the Gitsu GTSIO 520. Geared, turbocharged, injected, opposed. Or you can have something that's just more common like an IO 550. Yeah, it's just uh, fuel injected opposed 550. Does this have a turbocharger? No. 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 Um, LIO 360 that went into the uh, Pipers. Left hand. Had one left hand turning injected opposed, or it could be LTSIO. I think they might have made those. So remember that. Is there an RTSO? Or is there an RIO 360? No. No, no there is not. So the L means it's not a right hand. So the L is the weird one, right? So what is normal then? Right. So if that helps you, then hopefully it did. Um, what else do we have? Oh, I know one I used to build. Um, I built a couple of those. Vertical. Vertical opposed 435, so 435, so it, it had a big sump down the bottom and the crankshaft went straight up in the air and it had a big plate with the transmission bolted onto. So, all right, so the second designator, the second designator is in cubic inches. Um, rounded. to nearest 10. <coughs> so we like have an O200, that's what I have in my airplane. So how many cubic inch? 200. 200. Or maybe you have a Cessna, older Cessna 150, 172, you have an O300. Or maybe you have an older Cessna 175. This is a 170, the 170s, the 172s, Cessnas. The 175s had a 
Geo 300. What is that? Yeah, so it was a say it's 300 cubic inch, but now it's geared, so it's going to spin faster and give you more horsepower. Um, you get the idea, or you don't. Sorry. And then we'll say the suffix, the last designator. Suffix, and that is. So they don't just stop here at like the VO435. Like I have an O200. Hey, you have a in the in the shop a what? O290D. 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 So the suffix, the last part. Um, is additional information, additional info about about the engine, and it can get complicated, especially with uh, light combings. Like they make an IO three sixty A one B six D is a rather common one, and so it has all kinds of information on there, and I don't even remember. Uh, all of it. Uh, the D tells me it's got a dual mag. Uh, I, this gives me a, a basic configuration, I think. This part right here might tell me about what the crankshaft has for counterweights, that they're dynamic and what order they're in, and you'll figure out what that means later. So it has all kinds of information in there. You don't always have to know that. You just go, oh, it's a name of B60, whatever, you know. But, uh, all right, tells you more about the engine. Let's see. Yeah. What type of accessory case, uh, crankshaft. Yeah. Okay, so if I have an engine that is actually 196 cubic inches, I'm going to round it up to the nearest tens, which is here. So if I round six, uh, that's going to be, how would I, what would 196 be rounded up to the next? 200. To 200. Or if I had a 400 and a 468 cubic inch engine, what would I round it up to? I called a 470. Yeah. So it's not exact, it's just rounded up a little bit. Or rounded to the near, I should say nearest. So even if you had like a 473 cubic inch, what would they call it? Still called a 470. So you just round, round to the nearest 10. So there's no odd numbers out here. It's always, it always ends in zero. It doesn't always end up to zero. Light combing had to change things up. There's a light combing 541, which is really just a 540 with oil cooled exhaust guides, but they had to figure something different, so they added a one on it, so you knew that. So anyways. All right. Um, one more thing, I guess we can go on break. So just out of curiosity, how long did it take you to be able to memorize that? I don't have it memorized. Well, I mean, to be very, to be, uh, very familiar with it, not I don't know. Just one day you're there and you're going, I know stuff I didn't think I'd ever know. Okay. Um, I pulled this out of the, the type certificate data sheet and just put it into a different format so you guys could actually see it and understand it. But th this is some stuff about the 290D. Um, it's TBO, which means the time between overhaul. What the factory says is how long it should run to an overhaul uh, per service instruction 1009 Alpha Yankee is 12 years or the Model D can go 2,000 hours and the D2 can go 1,500 hours. Oh, what's the difference between them? Well, the D is 130 horsepower. Uh, takeoff RPM is 2,800, 80 octane fuel with crush ratio of 6.5 to 1. Has solid tappets and a hydro control. Yours does not have a hydro control. It was an option. Um, then they made the Dash 11. And this is how they do it. Well, it's the same as a 290D. So they just called it, right? They just called it uh, that. Now the D2 has hydraulic tappets, which tells me the D had solid tappets. And they did a So it just, this is how they do it. Same as but something different. Same as, but something different. Same as, but something different. So that's how, how you can see that. So, all right, uh, let's do a quick break.